Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you. I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to give this uh, presentation this morning, and it's glad to meet you all. Uh, I, there, there is really, just now Dr. Martin was talking about climate change and talking about its impact on the economy. I think he, did, although he did not explicitly state that, but there's obviously in his uh, brief talk, he mentioned about the social and political impact of climate change. And here I'm going to present some of a, a few studies that I, I have the opportunity of doing. It is a few uh, incidents that happens in the country of Taiwan and not Singapore, because in this country, if you have not already known, we have we don't have such disaster, we don't have typhoon, we don't have earthquake. We have a little bit of rain and a little bit of wind, and that's about all we have. It's an extremely stable and environmentally friendly as far as natural disaster is concerned. Uh, I will show you uh, some of the things that I have actually done, and I hope uh, this works. All right. Uh, I, I'm in the area of hydraulics engineering. I work on sediment transport. I also work on climate change. And I know some of you are in a very different area in energy sustainability and environmental sciences. So i am actually chosen a topic that is more general, I think. Uh, perhaps you can actually uh, be able to follow me because it is uh, the, the science that I'm working on is quite uh, uh, a natural event that you can actually uh, work on. Let's start by talking some preliminaries on erosion and scour. I think for those of you who come from country which has erodible rivers and, and riverbank erosions and scour, uh, uh, really unfortunate events and some people, especially people in the third world, they do have quite a serious impact on their livelihood. But they are un unavoidable very often. Some are due to natural disasters like typhoon-induced floods, or some are due to human interference into the uh, river systems or, or the coastal systems. And sometimes we build uh, bridges and we build hydraulics and coastal structures into the uh, environment. And some of these things induces other kind of impact on the environment, and, and they do suffer as a consequence. Show you some pictures uh, of um, scour. Scour is really just a localized kind of erosion. These are pictures taken from Mississippi in the United States. Those are actually abutment. Abutment essentially is just uh, the supports on both ends of the, uh, the river system on which maybe there is a vehicular bridge across it or a railway bridge. And if you can look at it, but anyway, uh, you can actually see this. those are spilled through abutments. Some of you who, who live near rivers and have actually gone below the bridge to have a look and you'll see those kind of things. And there is obviously the bottom right hand picture actually show the exposure of the foundation. If it is not careful, uh, the, the bridge may or will collapse as I've, I'm going to show you in this uh, uh, fuel investigation, the, the, the case study. There's another one, and the engineers, civil engineers and hydraulics engineers actually put a uh, gabion. It, it's just basically bigger rocks that put into some steel cage and try to protect the abutment. And sometimes it also fails. I think this is in upstate New York, this picture is taken. This is taken in the U.S. Midwest uh, somewhere in uh, the time is 1993 where, when Bill Clinton was still the uh, American president. And this is a culvert. Uh, if you can actually see the river is supposed to flow underneath the culverts and that is an interstate uh, freeway across this uh, roadway. And the, the flood water is outflanked the culvert and the culvert actually uh, fail and and of course vehicles here were driving from the east to the west of this midwest of the united states uh, i think you can actually see some some u-turn marks on those vehicles going backwards because they just cannot go forward anymore this this was a pretty terrible flood uh, during that year this is Gaoping Bridge in Taiwan in the year 2000, August 2000. Uh, some of you who come from Japan, you are familiar with this kind of flooding. Uh, these are typhoon-induced floods. Uh, the whole, whole bridge actually collapsed. From my understanding, uh, there were people who were injured, but uh, nobody died as a result of that failure. 2000, so about 14, 15 years ago, 14 and a half years ago. This is another, another bridge failure in, in uh, Taiwan. If you can actually have a look at it, I'll come over here, probably easier. This is actually a scour hole. This is the edge of the scour hole. And you can actually see uh, the pier actually has, uh, has fell, fallen down. And if you can actually see this, this piece of concrete, which is supporting the foundation, actually has actually sunk into the river, sunk into the scour hole as a result of which uh, the deck actually has fallen off. But 
uh, I don't think anybody was injured or hurt, except the bridge has to be closed. Of course, there are social and economic impact as a result of this. Now, what is happening here at the pier, for example, in the, the, the previous slide, it is due to these vortices that actually form as a result of the construction of an obstruction in the middle of the river that actually deflect the flow, causing vortices. Now, what am I trying to uh, show you this morning? I'm going to use another failure, a uh, bridge failure in Taiwan, in the central part of Taiwan near the city of Taizong. Uh, in 2008, the bridge is called Hofeng Bridge. I happen to be, have the opportunity. I happen to be traveling to Taiwan that year. I was invited to go over to do some uh, collaborative research. And uh, civil engineers sometimes very mean people. When, when, uh, when I was ready to go, my, my friends, my colleagues were telling me, oh, Professor Chiu, it's good that we have something to see this time when you come. But six people died because of this thing that we can see. Uh, so I have a chance to actually look at it. I was there two weeks after the failure of the bridge, and I actually followed through. As a result of it, we actually uh, wrote a paper in the, in the journals. And, uh, uh, much of the information that I'm talking today is actually from that paper that was published a couple of years ago. This happened in 2008, in September. Now, let's give you some background. On 12th of September 2008, uh, Typhoon Sinaku actually arrived in Taiwan. Of course, the, for those of you who, who live in that part of the Pacific Ocean, you are familiar with Typhoon. Other, other places call it different names, but essentially it's just a howling wind bring a lot heaps of rainfall. Two days later, that's uh, September 12th is when the, uh, when, the, when the typhoon actually hit. And two days later, uh, uh, the six-lane Hofeng Bridge across uh, the, the river is called Da Jia Si in central or Taichung County. Some of the central of Taiwan actually collapsed. Around about 7 p.m. it collapsed. On that day, the Taipei Times reported that one man was drowned and five were missing. That was on the day of, of the collapse. Okay, it doesn't work now. Here, this is a picture of a local newspaper, uh, Apple newspaper. Uh, if you can look at it, uh, over the other side, on the right-hand side is north, and towards this side is south. On well, the right-hand side is the township, is called Holy, and the, the, the township on the uh, left-hand side in the south is called Fengyuan. And this, the, the one that is shaded uh, black here are the two piers that has actually uh, fallen. As a result of which, the two bridge stack that is, it is supposed to be supporting actually fell into the river. There was uh, actually, more or less, not long after the flood, uh, six people as a result uh, uh, died uh, because of that event. Again, another picture of this uh, failure that is on the north here, that's the south, the river actually flows from your, our right to the left, that is in the eastern part of China, this is in the western chi part of China. It's not so far from the river mouth, it will flow into Taiwan Straits eventually. Um, and there is a mark in the dash circle, uh, red circle there, that is the pier that is actually fallen into the river. So that's actually very close to the river bank, and not at the center of the river, as most people will anticipate it is. They anticipate the main flood to be in the middle of the river. But in this case, it is not. I'll give you some reason why the river morphology has changed over the years. Some more background. The body of the dead person was actually found that day by the divers. He was a 23-year-old young man just starting his career, a cable TV engineer. His car uh, was plunged into the river when the, when the deck just collapsed, just at the time his car just arrived at that location. Uh, bridge cameras, they have uh, CCTV on board, and they also show two other vehicles plunging into the river, but uh, nobody was found at press time. I was there about, about two weeks after this date, September 14, September 16. Uh, but police reported, based on the CCTV, that one of the vehicles likely was a taxi with two passengers on board, and the other one was a motorcycle with a uh, with the passenger as well. So altogether, there are actually five people missing on the day of the collapse, but one was found confirmed to be dead. Finally, uh, the government uh, was uh, happy to report, not happy, but they, they have to make that report that all, all six of them actually died. Uh, in fact, when I was there, they found a second body. Okay. Now, uh, when we talk about this thing, uh, we talk about this being a 
an act of God, all right? It is a typhoon, there's nothing very much you can do, the, the bridge collapsed and people died. Uh, insurance people like to use this kind of word, but is it really, does uh, the typhoon, is the typhoon is solely responsible for the collapse of the bridge? Uh, that affected, of course, there is social, there is political impact, there's also a loss of life. Uh, so let's do an investigation. Now this, very quickly, because I know not very many of you are hydraulics engineers by training, I will just go through it very quickly. I just want to show you the bridge itself. It was built in uh, 1900s. It was extended as most uh, places in the world is uh, when originally we designed for a bridge. There are just uh, two ways up and two ways down, a four-lane highway. And, and with population growth, we decided hey, we need a bit more, more, more allowance uh, for traffic because traffic is bad. So they actually extended the bridge to two additional lanes. So it's three up and three down. So it's altogether a six lane way. And uh, during, the, during the 80s and really late 80s and early 90s, the, the Taiwanese government actually liked to use Kazon. Kazon is essentially a huge, huge kind of uh, circular kind of massive concrete structures. And they use that as a foundation. And up, uh, above it is the pier that support the bridge. You can actually see one, two, three, four pier under the, the column pier. You can see the Kazon diameters was four meters, the massive structures, and the pier is two meters. And it is a fairly long bridge, all right? Quite a lot of spans. I wouldn't uh, go bore you with this detail. We'll come back to them a little bit later on. I just want to highlight another thing under bad material. The first one is the median size. The what we call, if you like, is the mean size, but slightly different. But 80 millimeter is pretty big kind of stones in a river. A cross sect of that uh, bridge, uh, again, uh, the water is flowing uh, into the picture. On the right is the right bank. Uh, and this is the left bank here. There are actually 16 piers that support this bridge. And P2, the one that is marked uh, red, uh, is the one that fell, all right? Right almost at the right bank. Now, uh, if you have, go and get up any uh, geomorphology book or hydraulics uh, engineering textbook, uh, people will draw the center of the river to, uh, the, sorry, the deepest part of the river to be in the center part, which is normally the case. But if you look at this uh, little schematics, uh, this, are, this is actually, uh, a few data actually measured. Uh, you can actually see that the deepest part of the river is actually where the pier fell. It is actually at the right bank, not at the center of the river. It's, it's, it is the morphology of the river because rivers do take, take a bend. It doesn't just keep going straight. Uh, although when we do research, if you have colleagues uh, uh, in a flume, you go down to a hydraulics uh, lab and you look at their flumes, we always put the thing to be in the middle or at least or very often because of the lack of space, our flumes are normally all uniform cross-section. But in the river, it is not necessarily the case. And you can actually also see this, uh, the cross is actually the, uh, the survey done in the year 2000. Uh, 2005 is the second one with the open circle and 2008. Uh, before, I don't know whether it's before or after the, the failure, uh, that was actually measured in 2008. The bridge fell uh, in 2008. Now let's look at uh, this fragile country called Taiwan, which is subjected to a lot of natural hazards. They have earthquakes, they have typhoon, not dissimilar to some of these hazards that uh, uh, countries in Eastern uh, Asia is, is subjected to, places particularly in Japan, which has a very similar kind of uh, 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 environment as Taiwan. And more importantly, uh, they have extremely steep river, which is very, very unusual. Like the Japanese river, they are very, very steep. I want you to look at some of the pictures that we have done here. Now, this is the Colorado, one of the large rivers in the United States. Look at the gradient. It is really very, very gentle uh, to uh, the Taiwanese river. The, the three rivers here, the Dajia River, that's one that that uh, the bridge was founded on, you got uh, Dan Sui He and you can Zhou Sui He. They are all extremely steep. If you will look at this Rhine River, okay, they get to become steep, but they are way upstream. Uh, this is where the mountains are. But here, this is all, this is a river mountain. I'm sorry, some of this thing is written in Chinese because it's taken from, uh, from a Taiwanese report. Uh, here, they are really very, very steep. It's very, very uncommon to have rivers in the world that is that steep, near the river mouth. Uh, 
Taiwan is not a large country. And the reason is because Taiwan is, is if you like, like a potato that is actually fairly long, but very narrow. And they have fairly high mountain ranges in the middle. And therefore, they have really quite high elevation in the middle where the source of the river is. And going to the coast where is Taiwan Strait is, they really only have a little bit of length here. So from very high and over a short distance, inevitably you'll have an extremely steep river. And that's why in recent, when you've got steep rivers in hydraulic engineering, the water just comes straight down. It's almost like ski jump for those of you who go skiing, and you just come straight down almost that kind with that kind of high momentum. And that is really a high hydraulic scale potential. They have earthquake, they have typhoon. All these are contributing factors in addition to just the flood. Of course, the flood is important. Just look at the flood itself. Fortunately for us who, who are doing research in this area, Taiwan has got pretty good gauging station. There are two hydrograph. Hydrograph is essentially is a measure of either the depth of the river as a function of time or the flow rate of the river as a function of time. They have two measurements. The one that is in light blue, uh, this one, it's not tall enough to reach, that one there, okay, on top. Uh, it just go up, that is measuring water discharge or stage. In other words, the water depth. Generally, the higher the depth, the higher the flow rate as hydraulic engineer. It just went to that where that star is, the yellow star. Yellow star is the time when the bridge collapsed. Now, it, after that, uh, you can see that the light yellow curve is gone. No more. We have no more measurement. Why? Because, because the measurement is right at that bridge. The bridge fell, so you're, <laughs> you can't measure anymore. There's nothing to measure. But we have another measurement, which is the dash uh, white curve. That is measuring flow rate. This is measured at a dam called Si Gang Ba, which is actually five kilometers upstream of the bridge. So it's close. It's not that far away, five kilometers. If you can assume that what is actually happening at the location five kilometers upstream of another location, they could really arguably say they're they are very similar. So you can actually see that uh, the yellow curve, they, the flow rate actually start when on September 9, uh, typhoon came and then it started to build up right to the peak. And then it, of course, as the rain actually eases and it, it just subsides. Okay, very typical of a hydrograph. And you can actually see if this data were uh, believable, then you can see the bridge actually, uh, the failure actually occurs right at the peak of the flood, right there. It's not, not all the floods actually, oh, not all failures occur at the peak, but in this case it does. Now the measured flow rate, at least at a location 5 kilometers upstream of the bridge, was uh, 4,230 cubic meters per second. That's a lot of water. Okay, for a little country like Taiwan, it does not have that kind of catchment like, for example, in rivers in, in China, for example, like the Yangtze River, they, they have huge catchment. 4,230 cubic meters per second. Singapore, we are lucky we have 100. Okay? When we talk about flood here in this country, the Taiwanese colleague of mine, they, they will laugh. They say, what kind? This is not flood, this is just some dribbling of water. All right, so this is, this is the flood. So is 4,230 meters cubic per second large for that river? How, how, what is the uh, probable, probability of recurrence? What is the return period of this kind of flood? Here they have actually done some study on this particular river, Dajia River. And if you look at it, uh, those are maximum flood for that year. All right? Look at it, that one on the red triangle right in 2008, that is the flood that actually brought down the bridge. If you look at it, it that 4,230 meter cube per second. Now, hydrologists, people like me, we, we actually work on return period. Some of you do, some of you may not be uh, familiar with this kind of concept. In other words, for uh, 4,230 uh, cubic meter per second flood, it has a probability of recurrence of one in five years. In other words, there are 20 chances of occurring at any given time. So is it big? It's fairly big. Is it really that large? It's not, all right? They, they have, more or less five floods in their history of measurement way back to 1964, 63. There are five floods that actually exceeded this, all right? Uh, but all those preceding floods did not break down the, did not bring down the bridge. Uh, and finally, it, the, the red triangle. You can see a, some white dots, which is actually has a higher value than the red triangle. I have to move on. Now, this is one thing. It has large flood that day. 
but is it solely responsible for the, of the, for the failure of the bridge? Uh, it is not. Okay, there are other contributing factors. Now, another very important contributing factor in Taiwanese river is that in many of their rivers, the riverbed comprises of mud stone. Okay, that underlaid below the gravel. Just now, if you remember, I told you that the gravel in the river is 80 millimeter, which is fairly big stones. All right, and but underneath that very thin layer of gravels, they are mud stone. Now, these mud stone are not terribly good. It is almost like our instant coffee. If you actually throw some instant coffee, as most of us do, in a cup, and then we put some water inside, if you start stirring it, it will melt. All right. Something similar happens to Taiwanese river. Now, eight centimeter large gravel is there, uh, but they are not the problem. Not the gravel is not. The mudstone is. Some picture to show you the, uh, the geology. Uh, this is obviously the stone. One layer. And below it, you can actually see this stuff. This grayish looking color thing, they have actually absolutely no strength. Actually, if I have actually picked up some of those stones and put it in my hand, I can crush it. If you don't tell people they are mudstone, I'll be like Superman, I can crush a stone. All right, but it's not, it's, it is extremely fragile. So with this kind of torrential uh, flood uh, induced by typhoon, and it can actually melt this type, kind of thing easily. All right, and they do. You can actually see how fragile they are. All right, the third thing, we talk about an earthquake. Now, those of you who are following some Taiwan thing, you remember there's an earthquake uh, in Taiwan, Chi Chi earthquake in the central of Taiwan that created a lot of havoc to that country. And this is earthquake country, all right? Now, this is the river. This is uh, Highway 13, is the bridge where the bridge was founded. I talked about a dam just now. This is a dam that's about five kilometers upstream. And I want to show you what happens. Uh, my colleagues who study uh, uh, volcanic kind of action and lifting and fault lifting, they are very familiar. This, this is actually a very interesting thing. Engineers like to build things. And very often at hindsight, you'll find that if you want to choose a place not to build the thing, and the thing is built right there, all right? Now, you don't build a dam on a fault line, do you? All right, no, they, they build it on a fault line. Okay, let's have a look at that dam. This is five kil kilometers upstream of our bridge. All right, look, very innocent. Uh, the, the river, uh, just like a lot of developing countries in the 80s, Taiwan was, and they built a lot of dams for, for irrigation, for water supply, and et cetera, et cetera. Most countries do anyway. And this looking upstream, I want you to see, appreciate the, the underlying uh, uh, geology. It, this is mudstone, all right? It's extremely fragile. It, it melts, essentially. Uh, after the earthquake uh, in 1999, uh, some eight, eight years, nine years uh, before the, uh, the flood, this is what happened. They still leave this. When I was filling the dam, you can actually see one side was lifted up right at the dam face. It's just as well this dam did not fail. If it has fallen, Taichung, the city of Taichung, many, many people will die. All right. It did, it's, it did, not, did not come down. It's, it's quite surprising. Okay. Uh, still, they, they deliberately leave this there, okay, for, for people. If you go and visit this dam, if you visit Taiwan, if you visit this dam, you can still. I, I took this photo myself when I was there. Uh, you can see how, how much one side has lifted. Another picture. I just want to show you this picture, all right? Now, this is, I told you this actually, there's actually a fault line there. So one side was lifted. You can see that bridge. Now I'm looking. I'm standing on the dam face now, looking downstream. I've taken that photo. Look at that bridge. One side is significantly higher than the other side. Can you see that? It's almost like a slide. Now, they, 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 they did not actually employ a poor surveyor and, and messed up. It wasn't. It's just that one side was lifted during the Chichi earthquake. It became like that. It's, it's shocking. So, earthquake. What has earthquake to do with our river? What has earthquake to do with the failure of the bridge? Now, sorry, those numbers there, they are years, but they are years based on the Thai, Thai, Taiwanese years. So you have to add 11, all right? For those of you who know Chinese, I'll say in Chinese, it's in Ming Guo. All right, so this is, not our, this is not 1987. So 87, you have to add 11, that is 
1998. All right, and then 19, and then you have two, uh, 2000 there. That is 921. That's where Chichi earthquake. I want you to look at it. Here, the sorry again is in Chinese for those of you who do not know. Right about here, this is where the dam face is. Here is where the bridge is. All right. I want you to see this is before the earthquake. That is the year of the earthquake slightly. This is later on. All right. And you can see right here the dashed line and the red line and the green line. You can see the amount of bed has degraded substantially as a result of the earthquake. In other words, the river bed was here before the earthquake and then it drops and it drops as a result of the earthquake. It's actually quite frightening. Uh, again, the slope is actually quite, quite steep for, for rivers. All right, so we talk about earthquake, its impact on, on the bed itself. All right. Now we talk about the morphology. We have been talking about it, giving you a hint, because we talk about how the deepest part of the river is not in the central, but on the right bank. Because a river is a living kind of thing. It is not like what we do in the flume when I ask my students to do an experiment. Our side wall is always unmoved. It's made of glass or whatever it is. All right, it doesn't change. But river actually can outflank it. It can actually bend. It can meander. As if you still remember in your geography days when you were in schools, uh, uh, in high schools, and you'll, you'll probably read some of those things. So the morphology of river is such that the pier that collapsed is on the right bank, uh, and it also is subjected to the, to the main flow. I want you to show that as a result of the bridge, those colored things actually show you where the flow is coming from. All right. Now in the lab, when my students were doing experiment, the river is always moving straight down the river, uh, the, the channel. It doesn't bend. It's so narrow. But in real rivers, they can actually do all kinds of things. All right, they can actually curve around. And this curvature, this what we call the angle of attacks, they do change and they do, they may change and they do change. So you can actually see the way that it's actually flowing down. It's actually changing over the years. Uh, look at this is again the the highway thirteen is where the the bridge that fell is, you can see the river is actually moving, flanking the right one and hitting into where the pier was and that's when it fell. Okay, we have actually talked about a lot of these contributing factors. Now, let's try to put them together. Now, the degradation of the bed. Therefore, when the bed actually degrades, in other words, the top layer has now been taken away. What is the top layer? Top layers are the good gravels, big stones that create resistance, but now they are gone. So what is exposed is the mudstone. They are completely fragile. They can even melt in your flow with high turbulence. It's like us stirring our, our, our instant coffee in the morning. You stir it, it will melt. All right, so you keep losing it really, really quickly. And because of these changes, the bank actually moved away, and the morphology and therefore the angle of attack, where the actually main flow is coming from, they also change. They are all very important contributing factors. Let's show some pictures that we have taken. This is uh, innocent low flow. Did the Taiwanese engineers do something to protect their bridge? Sure they did. They put stones, they put tetrapods at the back. Those people who live in coastal area in the world, you see this kind of uh, man-made structures. They are actually patented, if I'm not mistaken, by the Dutch. Actually, they put it there. Normally, those are actually put in the, in the ocean uh, for protection. Uh, those are the, what was, I told you the caisson. This is a large caisson that, and those are the pier, and that's, of course, the bridge tank. They did a lot. This is during low flow, very innocent looking uh, water. Now, I hope this works. All right. Keep our fingers crossed. Okay, this, I can't say anymore. They are louder than me. Uh, this is innocent, actually, low flow. Nothing happens. No, nothing. Let's stop this. Now, this is the one that I want to show you the high flow. Hopefully, it works. Never mind, we'll, we'll just uh, go on. I'm sorry, I cannot actually show you the one with the high flood flow, uh, which is almost the whole, whole place was actually filled with water. But anyway, I got another one that's shown. Hopefully, this one works. Now, in other words, what I'm trying to show you that during the typhoon, uh, 
the flood is not like what we saw just now. It's not like a dribbling of water. Now, I just want to show you, just now the picture that I've shown you was taken from the left bank. So the water is flowing from that side to this side. Now we cross the river. We are now on the right bank. Now the water is coming from uh, the left to the right. Now I want you to show you, I do not know whether you appreciate this, this kind of plunging, where the red mark was, there's almost a little bit of plunge there. All right. Uh, perhaps I'll show you this. Uh, let's keep our finger crossed that this works. Come on, work. It doesn't work. It's normal. I'm sure you have. Maybe later, uh, later I can show you if we've got time. All right. Uh, what I want to show you is that uh, there's this, this is already a low flow. Okay, that the, the flood hasn't completely subsided, but it is certainly not 4,230 uh, meter cube per second. This is probably 1,000 something. It has, this is uh, a week or so after, after the peak of the flood. I want you to show, see this, appreciate this thing that actually plunges down. What causes this thing? You're not supposed to get these things. Something happened to make the flow actually almost like a rapid that actually plunges down. When it plunges, it hits directly onto the pier. The pier is here, the, the plunge pop, just hit there. It's almost like a jet of water that we did it. What happens is that this is a low flow. There's something there. This is the bridge on the right hand side here. Some, there are three blokes there standing on this concrete uh, uh, thing there. What on earth is there? Why do they build something there? There's a pipeline there. This pipeline supply municipal water to the city of Taizong. But if you have been to Taizong, Taizong is not a small city. It's a fairly large city, one of the largest cities. I think it's the third largest city in Taiwan with a lot of population. So they need water. So they actually, this is a municipal water supply line. They need to protect this pier. Uh, sorry, this pipeline. This just conveys the, the, the fresh water, uh, drinking water to the city. And when they actually built this, the the pipeline was buried into the riverbed, way down. But because, remember we talked about the degradation, the riverbed that has actually subsided, so much so that they actually has exposed this pipeline. So if this pipeline were exposed, if you are an engineer and if you are the, uh, the government agency, you say, no, this, this pipeline cannot fail. If it fails, there will be no water supply to Taizong and you probably lose your next election straight away, whoever who is in governing it. They have to protect this guy. So how do you protect this guy? So they encase the pipeline with this large concrete right there. Okay, so that's what they did, uh, rightly or wrongly. So as a result of it, uh, it became something like that. This is innocent looking, it doesn't look like anything. Unfortunately, my, my video didn't work. It will actually show you some more exciting thing and you see the water plunges right onto the pier. So those are actually important contributing effects. Now I've given you quite a lot of things. There's a typhoon, the high flow rate. There's the earthquake that induces degradation. We have this really fragile mudstone that underlay the top. And we have hu human make thing. Uh, the, the pipeline is just one of them. They also build other things downstream of the pier. They are all contributing factors. So we did an analysis of whatever information that we have. So at the end of the day, what we are actually trying to say is very typical of uh, a pier people like me who studied this for the last 30 years. Uh, we actually look at how deep the scour depth is, how deep the scour hole has go, so that the pier is actually exposed, the foundation is exposed. As a result of it, it can no longer sustain uh, support this vertical load that's coming down and therefore it failed. So what is uh, contributing it? That's a long-term general scour that is over the years. How much has this river degraded? And there's a short-term general scour that is during that flood. There is an imbalance of the sediment that comes in and the sediment that goes out. If what comes in is less than what goes out, then it will drop as well. We have contraction scour because of human beings decide to build things in the river system and actually reduce the cross-sectional flow of the river and it actually causes, uh, causes increase in velocity. And finally, we have local scour. This is the vortices that form around the structures that actually create a lot of undesirable erosion. So we actually use uh, some equation in published, published literature and based on whatever we can collect from the government agencies and whatever data they, they want to give, us, give to us, I better move on. I'm almost to the end. All right. 
this is again the same picture of uh, the riverbed, uh, uh, the profile of the riverbed. Uh, I just want you to show this. Uh, Hofung Bridge, this is the fourth uh, on the first one, uh, marked in, in red. This is before the earthquake, 1993 to 1999. All right. Now you look at it, on average, it actually the riverbed degrades 0.05 of a meter, two inches, five centimeters every year. Not very much, that much every year. Post earthquake, it drops half a meter per year. In eight years, it drops four meters. In Singapore, uh, one story is about three, three meters. All right. So this is more than a story over the eight years. So half a meter, that's a tenfold increase in the average degradation rate of this river. So this is actually a huge contributing factor to the river. So we use other equation in public, published literature and actually calculate what is the possible amount of erosions we have, uh, as I mentioned to you, long-term erosion, short-term erosion, local scour, and all the other. Uh, remember we talked about the jet as well? There's a jet scour because of that uh, submarine pipeline, the pipeline that's there, inducing this plunging flow. We actually calculate all those kind of things. And as a result of which, we find that there's a huge amount of erosion that has taken place. Just, I just want to show you, these are all drawn to scale in a sense. This is huge. This thing, that's, that's what it looks like, that encasing, that actually encases the pipeline there. It's a two meter pipeline, it's a huge pipeline, of course. This is for municipal water supply in Taichung. And our, based on our calculation, the, we, we found that the extent of scour and total erosion can actually undermine the entire caisson. It can actually lift the caisson up. It has the possibilities. Nobody knows what happens during the flood, at the peak of the flood. This is actually a hind casting based on whatever available information we have. Uh, but our study have shown that, is it possible to lift this case on out and therefore cause the pier to collapse? Answer is certainly yes, it can. not So what is the contributing uh, factors that bring down this thing? We actually try to put it into a pie chart kind of thing. Pier scour is close to 40%. Is it important? It is important. Long-term general scour is close to 30%. Plus the short term is close to one third. So if there is no Chi Chi earthquake causing the tenfold increase of bed degradation annually, this bridge may not fall, may not have fallen, may be still there. So earthquake contribute to this thing is, is quite far removed. Certainly we need collaboration. I do not know whether this thing happened in some Japanese river because there's a similar kind of uh, natural event in, in th that country as in Taiwan. I do not know. The jet scour is 21%. Now, if you did not put that pipeline there, would the bridge still be there and the six people still be alive? We do not know. But it certainly contributes. It's 20%. It's large. And the other things are not so, so important. Uh, if you look at it, that's already how many? There's 48, 48, uh, about 80, 80 odd percent of things. So let's make a summary and then we can have coffee. All right. Uh, for long term general scar at the Hofung Bridge, the calculated result reveals that about one third or 33 percent of the total scar depth is due to long term general scar and short term general scar. If this thing doesn't ha take place, maybe the peer will still be around. Uh, be around. The long-term general scale is clo so closely related to the Chi Chi earthquake that, that took place some eight years ago. Proper precaution must be taken if damage to or failure of downstream bridges is identified. In other words, when you actually look at the bridge here, this is a bridge that you are actually concerned with. You look at the surrounding thing on the same river and say something has happened. You must really it must ring a bell and, and find out, hey, what's happening there? If it happens there, it may happen to us as well. All right? If that, that bridge fell or that railway bridge has fallen and somebody died, the same thing may happen. That's Murphy's Law, right? Anything that happened will happen. All right. The failure of this bridge also highlights the potential risks associated with human interventions. For example, the construction and encased pipeline. They, they, all very often engineers do something and there's always a very good reason for doing it. In this case, 
water supply to the city of Taichung. If you don't have it, I mean, the guy will lose, the mayor will lose his vote immediately the next election if you don't have water to that city. You have to find alternative. Is that a correct solution? At hindsight, it is not. Today, after we've done this, and the local agencies were persuaded that this is a contributing factor. Now they have actually lifted that pipeline to be suspended. It says another bridge that actually now support this pipeline. It's no longer sitting on the riverbed. Right? They, they took it out. Bridge closure uh, should not simply be based on uh, fixed flood warning levels. In, in this kind of country, when you've got bridges, that is what we call scour critical. They, in the United States, they actually do this as well. Most of their bridges were built you know, just not long after the Second War. And uh, 50 years has come and gone, uh, past 50 years. So a, a lot of their inf infrastructures was now mm, past their design life, so to speak. And uh, looking at the economy of America, uh, they probably don't have that resources to actually rebuild all their infrastructure, which is, of course, extremely expensive. Unlike China, which is a growing country where they are building, everything is brand new. When it's brand new, nothing happens. But when you are 50, 60 years old, thing, things will actually uh, happen. Uh, so when, same thing in Taiwan. Uh, so we find that this is our recommendation that you have to be based on something actually more rigorous uh, scientifically rather than just simply. I just want to report to you what happens to that bridge. Uh, of course, the, uh, the bridge fell, six people died, and uh, that was the year that uh, President Ma ying just started his first term as president of, of Taiwan. And of course, when that happened and six people died, uh, there was actually political pressure on the president. So they actually built it. Within a year, they built a second bridge. All right. This is the new Hoven Bridge. The first one, of course, is gone. They built it. Uh, this is during the construction. I visited them during the construction. And 2010, it was open to traffic. Here, the blue thing here. This one is the pipeline now. <laughs> so it is actually elevated. So they have a second bridge for the pipeline. And that is a vehicular bridge over there. And so it's, I think it's 2010, it opened traffic. And if you go there, you'll be driving on this bridge, uh, not the old bridge, because the old bridge is gone. I think that's all I have. And before I go, I just want to acknowledge some of my colleagues. And that was the paper with four other colleagues. Uh, they're all Taiwanese people. Without them, I could write nothing because it's, uh, it's not my country. I need to have data. Uh, they are the one who actually helped me. And I did contribute in trying to understand some of the physics uh, and, and the contributing factor. The field understanding is clearly very important. And thank you very much for your attention.